Since 2013, Bombas has donated over 100 million socks, underwear, and T-shirts to those facing homelessness. If we counted those on air, this ad would last over 1,157 days. But if we counted the time it takes to make a donation possible, it would take just a few clicks. Because every time you make a purchase, Bombas donates an item to someone who needs it. Go to bombas.com slash ACAST and use code ACAST for 20% off your first purchase. That's bombas.com slash ACAST, code ACAST. Hello, everyone. Hi. Welcome to Fat Mascara. It's Jen Sullivan. So remember, what is it now? Maybe a month and a half ago when we started this whole experiment of bringing on guest co-hosts while Jess was on sabbatical. My thinking was we would all like someone enough to have them do like a repeat episode, a couple repeat episodes, and that would save me the work of identifying new people, onboarding them, preparing them, scripting them every week. It's a lot of work anyway. The point is, I can't freaking help myself. I am too curious. And every time I think, okay, we all know which guest co-hosts were great. And by the way, we all do know because you all have emailed me and messaged me about the same people. It's interesting how much we all agree. Then I think of another person I want to get to know and chat with. So bear with me because I have a few more guests planned, but I promise they are all our kind of people, especially today's guest co-host, Alexandra Pauly is the beauty editor of High Snobiety. So High Snobiety, in my mind, it's a media website that used to feel very devoted to streetwear and like early, early fashion and culture adopters, if that makes sense. But I'm going to ask her to explain it more so you can get a better sense of what they're all about. But Alex is a great writer with a unique take on beauty culture that I love. It shares a lot in common with the way I like to think about beauty, a bit cerebrally sometimes. You all know I can nerd out. Hello, Science Corner. But it's also business-minded, product-obsessed, passionate about beauty, and always fun and not too serious. So we met recently, and I thought she was cool, and I enjoyed her writing in the past. So I was like... Why not get to know her as a guest co-host on Fat Mascara? So please welcome to the studio, Alex Pauly. Alex, welcome to Fat Mascara. Hello. I'm so excited to be here. I can't say this to you, but you're longtime listener, first-time guest host. Yes, I'm a longtime listener. I've been listening to this regularly now for like about two years. So I don't know if I can call myself like an OG OG listener but it's to the point where my boyfriend recognizes your guys' voices. Because I listen oh, no. I listen to the pod, like, when I'm doing my makeup, fittingly, and, like, when I'm getting ready in the morning. And so he refers to you and Jess as the beauty ladies. I will take it. <laughs> I like that. I also like that you guys are comfortable enough that you can have us on speakers instead of in your AirPods while you do your makeup. Oh, no. I have it, I have it on full volume. <laughs> Oh, yeah. I wouldn't want to have AirPods in while I do my makeup. I feel, I don't know why. I know they don't cover up any of my face, but I feel like that would feel weird, right? Yeah. It would feel like constraining. Yeah. Speaking of makeup, look at my lips. They're destroyed at this moment. And now that we do video, I think this is Garrett. I'm like, ooh, I'm a fellow beauty editor. Tell me about myself. But I am convinced, tell me what you think of this theory that I just came up with. You know, all the new lip plumpers that are out right now? like the glosses with the maxi lip ingredient. Yes, yes. And it's not always the capsaicin of yesteryear or menthol. It's this like new plumping technology. I'm convinced they dry out your lips. Thoughts and opinions. That wouldn't surprise me. Honestly, I haven't tried any of them because they scare me because everyone that I've spoken to is like they freaking hurt. And I just don't want to put myself through that. But that wouldn't surprise me because I've heard also that like lip balm, for example, that has menthol in it, that actually is an irritant. And it makes you actually more dependent because it just puts you in the cycle of it irritates your skin, dries out your skin. And so you have to keep using the lip balm. I know, but it's one of these, menthol for sure. And it's one of these ingredients. They're like new lip gloss. What could go wrong? And I don't look at ingredient lists on lip gloss because I'm just like, I'll look at an ingredient list on a serum or a face moisturizer. But lip gloss, I'm like, it's just lip gloss. Here I am the last month of winter. It looks like I have cold sores. Shout out to anybody with cold sores. I know how horrible they can be. But like, it's just chapped. And I'm, anyway, the new lip plumpers proceed with caution, Fat Mascara listeners. Honestly, Aquaphor. Right. I know, but that's so boring. 
I want to play with all the things. And then Rihanna sends me Fenty Skin Kalahari Melon, <laughs> and I got to get in on that. That one actually seems like it's good. There's no plumpers in that. That seems like a lip mask and moisturizing. But anyway, that's why I look like this. Welcome to the show. I'm so excited to have you here. Thank I know you're you. a frag head like me. You write the most amazing yes. articles. I have to ask you, I usually ask, like, what's your first beauty product? I'm going to throw you for a loop. What's the first thing you ever wrote, ever, that you can remember? The first thing that I wrote ever? Like, not for a job, but just... No. Maybe there's a little (laughs) poem you wrote, mom or dad for Mother's Day or something, or, I don't know, story? I've always been really, really into fashion. So I used to make my own fashion magazines, and I've make them with like marker and printer paper. And so I'd have headlines on the cover. I would draw like a little model. And then I would do like, I'm so sorry. My dog is making some noises in the background. Hopefully you can't hear it. He's here for the fashion magazines. He's excited. Yeah. I would draw like the fashion spreads. Yeah. I feel like that, that maybe. Can you remember a headline? (laughs) I distinctly remember, I can't remember the headline, but I distinctly remember drawing a bunch of like different skirts and being like, these are the cool skirts that you need. And one of them was like a jean skirt. And then one had like little ruffled like tears. Yes. Hot skirts for fall. You heard it here first. Exactly. All right. So you're like, you've been into journalism, fashion, beauty, sounds like for a long time. But for our listeners who don't know what high snobiety is, obviously they just listened to me talk about you in the intro. But How would you describe it these days? It's grown a lot since it launched. It has grown a lot. It was founded back in 2005. So it's been around for a long time now. But I would describe it as a brand that really sits at the intersection of fashion and culture. So everything that we do is really about kind of contextualizing style. So for example, we're not just like covering a new purse or like a new makeup product, but we're really trying to explain where it fits into culture and why it's important. So we call our readers like the cultural pioneer. So they're someone who's really ahead of the curve. They're an early adopter of like trends and emerging designers. So another big part of our coverage is to, you know, amplify more like indie designers and creatives. So Mm -hmm. yeah, you can read High Snob online on our website. So wait, this indie ethos though, does it extend to your beauty vertical, which you launched, right? Just about a year ago. I remember when it launched, I was like, oh, what are they going to do? It's amazing so far. But do you try to highlight the indie beauty brands as well? Or what's the take when you're in the beauty vertical of high snobiety? Yeah, I mean, I definitely think I try to highlight emerging new brands. I love talking to new founders and interviewing them and kind of getting to the bottom of like why they're inspired to start their own brand. What's the last brand founder that you met that you were like, this person's cool? Okay, There's this new brand called Asset. Have you heard of it? No, teach me, tell me. It is a butt skincare brand. It's skincare specifically for your butt. Okay. And their very first product is called the Whole Serum, H-O-L-E, and it is a serum for your butthole. (laughs) Okay, so when you say butt to me, I feel like this is the vagina vulva conversation, but like a butt encompasses both our gluteus cheeks, right? Yes, And the hole that needs this serum. Why does the hole need this serum? Because we... Say, according to the founder. (laughs) Yes. At least we Americans, wiping culture, he said, is out of hand. We don't... Not all of us have bidets. I don't have a bidet. I would love one. But because of that, because you're constantly... There's constant, like, friction. So that area gets very prone to irritation. And for some people, that leads to itchiness, even, like, bleeding, tears... Etc. Oh, Mega Babe founder Katie Storino just talked about this recently on social media. Yes. Also, apparently, if you're pregnant, that can increase the irritation down there. If you have a job where you're sitting all day, that too. So yeah. it really is a very commonplace issue. So somebody started, okay, asset, cute name, a whole yeah. brand based on this. First of all, my husband for, I think it was our one or two year anniversary, got me a Toto toilet topper bidet. Like not the (laughs) the most romantic gift ever. It's the one that like, it sits. Meanwhile, guys, I'm the one who had to install it. Like I had to do the (laughs) plumbing because I'm good at that stuff. But anyway, that's the less romantic part of the gift. It sits on top of a regular toilet, but turns it into 
the bidet, with the dryer, with the warm water. It's the greatest thing ever. It's from Toto and I love it for the environmental impact reasons alone because you use less paper and wipes and things. Anyway, back to asset. You meet these cool founders. That's a recent one. Are you going to write about it? Have you written about it? I I have written about it already. I can send you the link after this. Absolutely. Please do. What's like a story you've been really proud of in the last year that you did for your site? Yeah, I have to say state of fragrance. So it's essentially a white paper that we released on kind of how young people today are interacting with scent. It was obviously, you know, fragrance is a is a passion of mine kind of outside of work as well. So it was really amazing to be able to kind of collaborate with our in-house research team. They surveyed hundreds of our readers about their relationship with fragrance, their fragrance hot takes, their favorite, their least favorite brands. And I think the result is a really great resource for both brands and fragrance lovers. And just talking to people, doing interviews for the story kind of confirmed a lot of my suspicions about what people want to see, what they don't want to see. What do they want to see? Well, one thing, not entirely surprising, because I felt this way for a long time. I don't know about you. People are so sick of celebrity ambassadors, celebrity faces for fragrances. Every single person I spoke to was like, (laughs) stop hiring celebrities to be the face of fragrance. It doesn't make sense. We don't like it. Was everybody you spoke to American? Just wondering. Not everyone. I interviewed one person. I interviewed a couple of people from London. Okay. And they don't like the celebrities. Because I was going to say, the European brands love to hire a celebrity for a fragrance commercial. Yeah. That's not what people want. I also saw you did a story on the gourmand fragrance trend and tying it to diet culture, which I thought was fascinating. Did some of the things in that story come out of the research you were doing when you were putting together the trend report? No, you know, it's interesting. They were not at all connected in my mind. I actually came up with the idea for the gourmand story after I was on Perfume Room, which I know you and Jess have been on. Yeah. Love, Emma. But we talked about the gourmand trend during the episode when we were recording, and she kind of made this comment where she was jokingly like, are are we just hungry? Is that why we want gourmands? And then after, I was kind of thinking, you know what? Maybe, Maybe she's right. Maybe we are just hungry. And then she ended up actually getting some really interesting DMs from listeners saying, it's so interesting that everyone wants food scented fragrance during a time when we're really kind of reverting to the thin ideal. I mean, not that it really ever went away, but I guess pushed me to kind of interrogate my own relationship to eating and sugar in particular, because a lot of these gourmands are very like desserty, vanilla-y. Yeah, that was another, that's definitely another one that I'm also proud of. It was great. I loved it. What are you wearing today for your fat mascara debut? Do you have a fragrance on? I do have a fragrance on. It's actually, we'll talk about more during Raisin Wand, but I'm wearing a uh, She Maison. knows the show well. I like it. Oh, okay, yeah. save it for Raisin Wand. You're going to Raisin Wand <laughs> to it. Okay, okay. Yes. Let's hold it out so people can wait for that. I was thinking about like how to get to know your personality better and something that we both write about a lot or at least have to consider is beauty collaborations. I just saw, did you see the one that Elf Cosmetics did with Liquid Death? Yeah, actually, did you see the commercial for it that came out? I saw the still campaigns and I was going through them, but I didn't watch the video yet. Why do you ask? Oh, the video. The video is really cute. Like, I I have to give it up for them. It's... I mean, it was a genius collaboration. Yeah. And then did you see, like, Julia Fox did her whole thing where she debuted it out, out on the street in New York? She can do no wrong in my eyes. Yeah, yeah. So I was thinking about that. That was a really good one. There you go. Bit of news before we even got into the news. But, like, what would be a dream collab for you? Like, what would you like? I would buy that in a second. I feel like makeup collaborations can get super gimmicky very quickly. <laughs> I mean, did you see today? I think they just announced Shrek and Lush are doing a collab. <laughs> yes. I think there was one before that really? I can remember. I mean, that wouldn't surprise me. Yeah. Okay. So this one is with what brand? Sorry. Lush. Lush. Okay. Love Lush. Nothing against Lush, but I just, I don't want a bath bomb that makes my bath water look like a swamp. (laughs) Is that the premise? (laughs) Yeah. Okay. It's like the the whole premise is like, get out of my swamp. (laughs) I, this goes to those like, all right, I called them stunt perfumes before. This is stunt beauty products that you don't actually think people want, but they will make a social video about 
and then you're just, it's literally just to sell. You are not fulfilling a need. You are not making my life better. Maybe a kid would be really into that, but Shrek's like an old movie. It's not even like a cool young movie. Yeah, I mean, it's a classic for sure. Yeah, it's a classic, but. But I mean, yeah, it's it's like a fun thing to buy if you like want to make a TikTok video about it. You know what's going to happen? It's going to backfire and everybody's going to make a video about what their bathtub looks like (laughs) after they drain it, after they did the Shrek Lush Bomb. Yeah, yeah, totally. Sorry, there's no reporting behind that. I don't (laughs) actually know if it'll stay in your bathtub, but it's just my thinking. In terms of something that I would love to see, I mean, maybe this isn't exactly a collab per se, but obviously Drees Van Noten just stepped down or stepped away from his brand. I would have loved to have seen his beauty line expand under his creative direction. Obviously, have you seen the perfumes and the lipsticks? I'm sure you have. Yes, I I seen them. I did not get to try them. Did you? Yes. One of Tell my all-time favorite scents is the Dries Van Noten. It's called Fleur du Mal. It's like an osmanthus scent, but it brings out like the peachiness of osmanthus. So I would consider it a fruity fragrance. And then there's a base note of suede in it that's really, really sexy. It's a perfect like the weather is getting warmer kind of scent. Oh, it's like a transition to winter to spring from the suede to the osmanthus. Yeah. And he was involved with the original launches, I remember reading in the press release. Yes, I, I'm i pretty sure. So you want to see the color under his direction? Yeah, I would have loved to have seen like a Dries Van Noten eyeshadow palette. Like I can just, I'm imagining it right now. All the colors inspired by like the flowers in his garden and like the the packaging I can imagine would be just like gorgeous. I like that. All right, let's put it out into the world. Maybe it'll come back. Maybe he'll be like, I miss... He doesn't want to do fashion anymore, but maybe he'll miss the beauty. I I can never see that happening. He's a fashion designer. (laughs) Nope, I'm just going to work on the beauty collaborations. But that's a good one. That gives us a sense of your style and sensibility. I like that. One more that I would love to see is like an Amy Winehouse eyeliner (gasps) or something. Now, do you want to do it a posthumous? Because I know Mac did Selena with her family. You would have liked it when she was still with us. Yeah, I know that kind of the makeup collab boom kind of came after her time, unfortunately. But I I think, yeah, I would have loved to see her come out with some special edition, like eyeliner. That would have been good. That would have been good. I know Adele has filed trademarks. Completely different kind of music. I was just thinking about it because it's a black eyeliner look. Completely different kind of black eyeliner look. And I'm like waiting to see what that's going to be. Can you hear my dog in the background? I heard a little growl every now and then. What's your dog's name? His name is Cam. Cam, keep it down. It's okay. So before we go into the news, I did want to ask you, you're up on everything that's going on in the beauty industry. Is there a particular story or trend that you like following that you just cannot get enough of? Yes, definitely. I love... What is it? I love all the TikTok microtrends, but specifically like the names that people come up with for them. So it's just Hit like, me it's, with some. <laughs> yeah, it's endlessly, it's endlessly entertaining for me to see like the links that people go to repackage like very boring beauty things. So glazed donut skin, it's just like dewy highlighted skin, blueberry milk nails, literally just blue nail polish, <laughs> cinnamon cookie butter hair, strawberry girl makeup. Wait, I've seen cinnamon cookie butter hair. Yes. Yeah. This is because they're hungry, like thin culture is making them hungry, I swear. It's the same thing that you said about the fragrance. (laughs) Yeah, it's totally the same thing. But also, I will say, like, it it does make sense because food is such, like, a universal touch point. And it's such a good way to describe the color of something, the texture of something, like, obviously the smell of something, where if you, like, say it to anyone, they'll be like, oh, yeah, I totally know what you're talking about. So it does make sense. But, yeah, like you said, kind of the connection – to like diet, diet culture and gender is is also very, very interesting to me. Yeah. And I just, I have to go back to also the ability to join in the crowd. I have a social media manager now and she's like, everybody's doing this on TikTok. Do you want to do your take on it? And I'm always like, nope, no, I do not. (laughs) I do not need to add to the trending hashtag because I just, feel like that's the reason some of these trends take off, not because people want to look like cinnamon cookie butter hair, but they want to be, which was fine to be part of community. That's what a big part of beauty is. But sometimes it feels so performative and fake. Yeah. I also think these are like manufactured names that, you know, like PR companies and even like journalists come up with and then just like keep snowballing. Yeah. Is it top down? 
I don't know. I could see journalists. I definitely did that back in the day. I mean, that's part of the job when I worked in a teen magazine to come up with cutesy names for things. But some of them, like broccoli freckles, come on. (laughs) I didn't think of that. And a PR person did not think of broccoli freckles. Like that was a bored content creator. But yeah. That I can't get enough of it either. And you know it's going to ramp up now that we're getting into spring and summer. There's definitely going to be, mm-hmm. like, whatever this summer summer girl is, whoever yeah. she's going to be. <laughs> it was, Last year was tomato girl summer, right? Right. So this summer, I mean, at this point, it's like what Haley Bieber does, I guess. Yeah, it yeah becomes it's whatever Haley does. Maybe. We'll see. Hopefully something new and fresh will come in. But shall we go talk about the news? Because I know there's some things you wanted to talk about. Yeah, let's do it. Okay, it is time to talk news that we've been doing that all along. So once I knew you were coming on the show, we were texting about things to talk about, and you sent me a link to a story about the Swedish pharmacy chain, Apotec Hartet. Apotec Hartet. I practiced saying it, but I know I'm (laughs) not doing it well. Anyway, this Swedish pharmacy banned sales of advanced skincare to kids under 15, and you've since written about this as well. What's going on here? Yes. So... Any child under 15 years old is banned from buying what they call advanced skincare products. So what makes a skincare product advanced? Basically, advanced ingredients include retinol, which is vitamin A, as I'm sure we all know here. Vitamin C, which often uses like a brightening agent and like serums and creams. Peeling enzymes. So they didn't really specify exactly what they mean by peeling enzymes. Like, I'm going to assume they mean some of these, like, fruit enzymes that are often used in exfoliating masks. So papaya, pineapple, and then also exfoliating acids. So that includes your alpha-hydroxy acid, your beta-hydroxy acid, your lactic acid, glycolic acid. So that's what the ban includes. Okay, clearly this was a response to seeing younger people getting into skincare and even anti-aging skincare. What's your thought on if this will work and or if this is the way to go with this? You know I have thoughts. But you're my guest, so I want to hear yours first. (laughs) I'm excited to hear your take. I mean, listen, I don't think it's a bad thing by any means, But, you know, at the same time, I think it's going to be so easy for anyone who wants to get their hands on these products to just find an alternative supplier. Like you can just go online. You can, you can buy anything online. Supplier, like their drugs. I got to get my, I got to get my advanced skincare. (laughs) But truly in some cases they do. I mean, vitamin A, retinol, if you're 14 and have acne, you might really want that ingredient. Yeah. And they are making an exception for people who have a skin condition or people who have permission from their parents. So it's not a total, complete ban. But I do think that we should be placing the focus more on, like, educating parents about how to talk to their kids about beauty culture versus making these products prohibited. Because I think once something is off limits for kids that young, I think it just reinforces the idea that that thing is desirable. It's like the whole thing with underage drinking. Like you want 100% it because you don't have it. my take. Like, like the way to get someone to do something if they're that age is to tell them not to do it. And it's yeah. like reverse psychology. Oh, I think it's just for peace of mind of the parents to do this. In fact, I don't even think that they care that they're selling to the underage kids. It's like, look, we're helping your children. We're the pharmacy that cares about you and your family. You know, there's like 500 locations yeah. in Sweden. If I was an adult and nervous about this and saw it on social media, I'd be like, Apotec Hartship really cares about my kids. Yeah, no, I totally agree. And on that vein, I think it was the same week or maybe it was the week after, Kiehl's launched a social media campaign. I wouldn't call it a campaign. It was like a couple posts here and there. It was an image of kids playing in mud, and the tagline was like, the only type of mask children should wear. I might be paraphrasing there. Meaning like, you don't need to give a face mask to your kid. They should be outside playing in mud. Which I thought was... Interesting coming from a skincare brand because yeah. we've seen other skincare brands embracing their quote unquote underage consumers. I thought again this might be pandering to the parents who are nervous about this. Did you see that campaign? Yes, I saw it. And I, I agree. I also have mixed feelings about this. Like I don't disagree with the core message. Like it's no, totally I love the message. That, yeah, like brands should not be marketing anti-aging products to children, like plain and simple. But then it's also 
What about people who are in their 20s and 30s? This is a brand that still sells anti-aging products. And the connotation is that it's not okay for kids to worry about aging, which is true. But then like, what about people in their 20s and 30s? I mean, even people who are older, like in their 40s, 50s, 60s, should they even feel the pressure to want to look younger? Yeah. And the the pharmacy that did the ban and some of these things, they feel like a band-aid. They're not solving the actual root of this problem. Like, why are our kids interested, our kids, like either, you know what I mean? Like, why are they interested in anti-aging products? Why are they interested in so much skincare? It's because our culture has an obsession with youth. It's because they have photo filters on all their photos. It's because consumerism is rampant and you want to collect things and skincare seems very collectible. So it feels like instead of addressing those root problems, which I've seen some other campaigns do, they're addressing a more superficial side of those problems. Yeah. I mean, and that makes sense because actually getting to like the root of these issues is so daunting. I don't necessarily blame them, but I do agree that it's more of a Band-Aid fix. Yeah. And there's been other campaigns on social media, even about the photo filters, like when that Glamour, what was it called? Glamour, what last summer, what was that photo filter that everybody was using for a hot second? And it was oh, just on um, Bold Glamour. Bold Glamour, right? When Bold Glamour came out, there was like a beauty brand that immediately was like, this is our version of Bold Glamour. Like, don't use the photo filter, use this product. And again, I was just like, well, you're not helping because your photos are retouched as well. Like, if you really want to help, then we need to start there. But it's also like, I love the glamour of the beauty industry and I kind of like the mystery here and there. So I can see both sides of it. But that pharmacy, I believe it has like 500 stores in Sweden. It has just gone into effect. We'll link to, we can link to your story. Let's link to your story. This is first. I will link to Mm -hmm. Alex's story because she wrote about it in case you want to look into that more. Do you want to go over to Science Corner? It actually ties into what we were just talking about, shall we? Yeah, let's do it. There's a new study that just came out in Nature, the journal, about why teens may smell gross to their parents. So we all know chemosensory information is conveyed by body odors. I mean, you know that when you think about a person that you love, like there's a scent to people and some people just turn you off or turn you on. Well, when it comes to children and parents, there's studies that show parents are able to identify their own child's, like infant child's scent, and they prefer that scent over the smell of other children. But what happens is when kids go into puberty, this isn't part of the study, but just some background, they found in studies that parents are often like, more than a stranger averse to the scent of their own children during puberty. We've all heard the joke, like, it's probably happened to all of us when we were going through puberty and our parents are like, you stink. And it's almost like you are convinced that you smell because your parents say so, and you put on all this deodorant, and then you go out into the world and you think it's fine. Here's the thing. You might not smell as bad as you think you do, adolescent child. Your parents actually might be perceiving your scent as worse. And the reason is they think, this is a theory, that because an aversion to their smell might actually help to prevent inbreeding, it's like you've become into puberty. And if you're living in a small society, let's take it back to the cave people and whatever, like that would show you this is a person that I'm not meant to have a relationship in children with because we have some genetic connection. So the researchers wanted to look into this. So they studied, okay, I love I love picturing the methodology for some of these things. They took 18 healthy infants and 18 pubertal, this was a new word to me, but like <laughs> children in puberty, average age around 15, and they sewed cotton pads into their clothing, and then they removed the cotton pads and they analyzed them for their odor compounds. They did this with natural fragrance evaluators who can use their nose and words to tell you, but also with Gas chromatography mass spectrometry, GCMS. You know, the same way they might take a perfume and they do that headspace to find out what molecules are in it. Turns out, for sort of the fragrance evaluators called some of the substances in the teen <laughs> cotton pads goat like. Like, not just like animal barnyard, but a goat like aroma, a musty, cheesy aroma and an earthy aroma, something that the children didn't have. So Helene Luce, who's an aroma and smell researcher at the University of Nuremberg that did some of this, said they don't have a global consensus on how to describe those odor, but ultimately they landed on goat-like. So the teens smell goat-like where the toddlers smell like flowers. That's a really simplified version, just the (laughs) toddlers had a sweeter 
a sweeter type of note to it. I don't know what you're going to say, but what did you, have you seen this study or the link that I sent you? What'd you think? I certainly looked at the link when you sent it because it's hilarious. Goat-like. I love that. I feel like every time I do Science Corner with the guest co-host, they're like, why did they study that? (laughs) I mean, okay, the inbreeding part is so interesting because like you said, the smell of someone, they say, can like influence your attraction to them. So it's like the whole pheromone thing. And that's why pheromone perfumes are a thing. Like people think that they are going to attract their crush by like wearing specific chemicals that trigger some primal response in their brain. I wrote about that for the cut. There's literally no science to it. All the people I talked to are like, we don't even have the receptors to smell, quote unquote, pheromones the way animals do. But continue. Yeah. Which is, it's so funny. I don't know if you've ever seen Millionaire Matchmaker. I, I love that show. But Patty Stanger from Millionaire Matchmaker just came out with a pheromone perfume, quote unquote, pheromone perfume <sighs> this past Valentine's Day. Did you smell it? I did not. <laughs> this study reminded me of a TikTok that I recently came across. And disclaimer, I do not know if this is scientifically accurate. So please fact check it. Pseudoscience corner. Alex gets her own corner. Pseudoscience. Yeah, pseudoscience (laughs) pseudoscience corner. So this woman was talking about why baby heads smell so good. Like you were saying with the toddlers, like they smell kind of sweet. And this person was alleging that it's because their skull has not fully developed. So they have that soft spot where the bone has not come together. What? Okay. And she was saying that they smell good and what you're smelling is their brain through the soft spot in their skull. It sounds very far-fetched, but I'm curious if anyone can confirm or deny. Okay. I might in post-recording pop in here to confirm or deny after we do some research because the only thing I've ever heard is that if a baby is feeding on breast milk, there is a vanillin, vanillin might say the molecule wrong, compound in breast milk that then they emit a little bit that has like this vanilla kind of scent to it that can be pleasing to a lot of people. Okay, that makes sense. But the top of the head thing, yeah. Because puppies actually emit scent on the top of the head. You know how puppy head, there's even a perfume I think called puppy head. Oh, really? Wow. We're getting too deep that we have to, we haven't pre-fact checked this, guys. (laughs) But the top of the head thing, I'm like, well, that's just what you sniff when you go down, bend down to like hug a kid and they're just delicious, you know? But, oh, the brain smell? No, thank you. If that's true, I'm going to be grossed out whenever I smell baby's head from now on. Yeah, yeah, totally. Okay, future Jen, just jumping in here as I'm editing the episode. Of course I had to look into this right away. It is just a coincidence that the soft spot or fontanel on the top of a baby's head is where it also smells good. You cannot smell organs through skin. However, in 2019, researchers in Japan did an analysis of baby head aromas hours and days after birth, and they found a composition of 37 volatile odor components, including aldehydes, which often smell good, and carboxylic acids. So they actually deduced that some of these odors could be traced back to amniotic fluid, but the data suggested they were continuously secreting at least 14 of those odors for days afterwards, even as they washed. And it's theorized these come from their glands and their skin, again, not from their brains. Okay, back to your regularly scheduled programming. And by the way, we'll put the links to that study and all this stuff in the in the show notes, so you guys can check it out later if you want to. Okay, moving over to business desk. I have just a little retail roundup for us. I thought it was exciting to hear that Ulta Beauty is expanding into Mexico. Um, I remember they were supposed to go into Canada and then, I don't know, a little thing like the pandemic happened. So that's good news. Then Sephora is actually exiting Korea. They had six stores there and they're closing them. But over in England, they're expanding. I just had on a guest co-host, Sharice. She's British. And she was like, people are loving it over here. So then I think that Third, they're opening their third store, which will be in Manchester, and then a fourth in Newcastle for all our British listeners. Where do you shop for beauty as I'm going through this little retail roundup? Sephora. Sephora mainly, for sure. Okay. I do love the Bergdorf's beauty floor, though, but obviously it's a little bit on the pricier side. I love to browse there, though. But honestly, we get sent so much stuff. She's like, I shop my closet <laughs> from the publicist. Yeah. Stuff. Yeah. And then just to round this out, here in Brooklyn, 
I know you're on the Lower East Side. I'm in Brooklyn. The old Shen Beauty, which unfortunately closed down, has now been taken over by a Cos Bar. So there's a Cos Bar, speaking of upscale beauty retailers, in Brooklyn as well. And then a new, if you're, because people are always asking us, oh, I'm going to be in New York. What beauty shops should I go to? And I thought this one was really cool that I checked out. The Brazilian fragrance company, Granado. They've been around since the 1800s. They actually used to do the official Brazilian imperial family's fragrances. They just opened an outpost here in New York. So I want I want to know where you shop because I always tell people, I call it Perfume Row, but it's just Mulberry Street. It's like there's a DS and Durga, but then if you keep walking, there's like four more fragrance shops. Fueguia is down there. Maybe Adis de Venustas, but all these little perfume shops. But what do you say when you have friends coming to town who want to shop? Yeah, I tell them the same thing to go to Perfume Row. I love Oswald. What is Oswald? It's right across the street from the Diaz and Durga store on Mulberry. It's a niche fragrance boutique. The thing I love about them is that they don't keep anything like behind the counter. So you can just go in and just spray whatever you want yourself and take your time. You don't have to ask people like, oh, how do you pronounce this brand's name? Blah, blah, blah. And they're super nice. They also have this amazing wall of just like like the mini perfume bottles. Yeah, they have a wall of just like vintage ones. And it's amazing. That's cool because I'm so used to seeing people with collections of the large, like the... Yeah. What are they called? Jess Matlin would know this word. Yeah, there's a specific term for it. Flac cone? That can't be right. But the large perfume bottles that they put at the department stores, but I've never seen a mini bottle collection. They're so cute. Oh, I love a miniature. Yeah. And I think the last time I went there, the person working told me that this collection took like decades to build up. Oh. But I love that place. It's great. They're all really, really nice. They have all your niche brands there. All your niche needs are met at Oswald. Okay. I'm going just to check out their vintage bottle collection. Thank you for that tip off. And that rounds out the news. I just wanted to share the retail happenings. Let's go raise some wands. Hey, Dave. Yeah, Randy. Since we founded Bombas, we've always said our socks, underwear, and T-shirts are super soft. Any new ideas? Maybe sublimely soft. Or disgustingly cozy. Wait, what? I got it. Bombas. Absurdly comfortable essentials for yourself. And for those facing homelessness. Because one purchased equals one donated. Wow, did we just write an ad? Yes. Bombas. Big comfort for everyone. Go to bombas.com slash ACAST and use code ACAST for 20% off your first purchase. Okay, everyone, I am one of those people who, when it comes to wellness, sorry, but it's got to fit into the pockets of my day. Five minutes here, seven minutes there, when I'm like in the kitchen and I'm microwaving something long, it's got to be convenient. And that is why Aloe Moves works for me. My mindset has changed. The app makes it easy for me to keep my wellness routine on track because they have everything in one place and bite-sized little bits. Yoga, Pilates, fitness classes, mindfulness, self-care tips, healthy recipes, so much more. From beginner to advanced, Allo Moves has the flow or class that's going to fit into your schedule. Their classes range from five minutes to an hour, depending on what you're feeling that day. You know what feeling I'm feeling most days? I'm feeling 10 minutes. I've been doing that's good. Joanna Thompson's. Right? That's about it. Yeah. Yeah, that's good. 10 minutes. Joanna Thompson does these yoga lattes in 10. One day will be abs. One day will be arms. Today, Jess, is booty day. And we're just <laughs> going to get it done all in 10 minutes. If you're trying to get a good sweat, then you've got to try their award-winning workouts like the sweat-inducing yoga flows or the reformer Pilates workouts without weights. You can also find stress relief with meditations, affirmations, face yoga, gua sha, learn to do dry brushing. How many times have we talked about dry brushing on this podcast? Allo moves will teach you how to do it. Unlock your personal wellness routine with Allo Moves. Go to allomoves.com now and use the code MASCARA20 for an exclusive 30-day free trial and enjoy 20% off an annual membership. That's allomoves.com, code MASCARA20. allomoves.com, code MASCARA20. All right, it's not often that we talk about supplements, but when we do, you know that we mean it, all right? Every day I do my skincare routine and that is a cleanse. I moisturize. Of course, I pop a little antioxidant in there. I'll do a little serum underneath there. But what is non-negotiable for me lately is I take a supplement. 
That is my Ritual Hyacera. It's a wrinkle support skin supplement, which is clinically proven to reduce wrinkles and improve skin smoothness. I'll take that. I'll take it too. Ritual Hyacera is a once daily skin supplement. Jess said clinically proven. Let me give you the deets. In a clinical study, Hyacera led to a 3.6 time reduction in crow's feet wrinkles within 90 days as compared to placebo. Jess and I have been taking it more than 90 days. Let me tell you, it works. Plus, Ritual Hyacera has led to a 2.9 times increase in skin smoothness in the same amount of times. It's rigorously tested and validated by a third party for allergens, micro and heavy metals, you don't always know if a supplement does that. Ritual also has industry-leading sustainability standards. They use scientific tools to select lower carbon packaging, love that, prioritize sustainably sourced ingredients, and set ambitious climate goals. Plus, female-founded, B Core, meaning they're holding themselves accountable to not just their company's financial health, but also the health of the people and our planet. You gotta love that. Yes, okay. Start Hyacera to help minimize wrinkles without compromising on clean science. Hyacera from Ritual is a clinically proven skin supplement you can actually trust. Get 25% off your first month for a limited time at ritual.com slash mascara. Start Ritual or add Hyacera to your subscription today. That's ritual.com slash mascara for 25% off. Okay, it's time to raise a wand I know already there's like 17 of you screaming the name of those large perfume bottles. And Alex and I were like Googling when we got off the mics for a second. I was like, whatever, let's just keep recording. And then our fabulous listeners are going to fill us in on the word that we totally forgot. It's time to raise a wand. I am going to play a little, oh, I'm going to play a listener raise a wand because this ties back actually to what we were talking about at the beginning of the show. I was asking listeners for lip balms, and now that I'm back in recovery, because I used all these lip plumpers like a dummy, of course I have a great listener who wanted to share some lip balms, so let's listen in. Hi, Jess and Jen. This is Jess from the Boston area. I am a part-time makeup artist, but I'm a full-time kindergarten teacher and new mom, and so I kind of run the gamut in what I need in a product. I want something that is effective. I know my stuff because I'm really into cosmetics and I'm really into makeup. I'm an OG listener from the very beginning, but I'm also a new mom and my job is no frills. So I want something that works and is also really no frills. So I have two lip balms from Jen's. I'm a little bit behind, I think, but I know you had a homework where we had to give our lip balm favorites and I have two that are a little bit off the beaten path, but work so, so well. The first one is called Lipsil, L-Y-P-S-Y-L. It's the intense protection. It has like, I think beeswax or something in it. It's not that waxy Burt's Bees feeling though. It has a little bit of a minty hint, but it's not overwhelming. It stays on. I don't know if this is going to last you all day, but I feel like it passes that one hour test. It's fabulous. I buy like a 10 pack on Amazon. I should probably go buy one before you guys sell it out. That one's awesome. And then I've been using this for years and years, but I couldn't get it for a little while until it came on Amazon because I got it when I went to the pharmacies in France a couple years ago. It's Oriage, U-R-I-A-G-E, Barriadurin Cigalips Protecting Balm. They do have one that is like a twist up kind of chapstick. This one is the balm, the twi- like in the squeezy tube. This is the one that you want. Unbelievable. I kind of used it as a mask overnight, but I use it during the day. I always have one in my pockets and I actually found one in a jacket from last season that I'm super pumped about. Both of these are the best of the best. And like I said, they're not like the ones that you see in every CVS. I highly, highly recommend them from a makeup artist, beauty enthusiast, new mom, kindergarten teacher, somebody who like has really high standards. Highly, highly recommend. And they really also don't break the bank too, which is another amazing point. Thank you guys for putting out awesome content all the time. Really appreciate it. Again, OG listener. Love you guys. Okay. Jess, listener Jess, thank you very much for those. I think the Barry Derm Sika Lip sounds amazing, but now I'm nervous about the lip sole because it's an original mint flavor. And as Alex pointed out, if that mint comes from menthol, it would be drying. If I asked you this, would you just say Aquaphor is the answer, Alex? Yeah, I think Aquaphor, it's not the most glamorous product, but it's popular. It's been around for a long time for a reason. All right, fine. Listen, if you guys out there have something you want to raise a wand to, you could still help me. 
with my lips, that would be fine. Actually, Alex, is there anything you've been looking for lately? Hmm. That's a good question. While she thinks on that, I'll tell you the phone number. It's 646-481-8182. Or if you ever raise a wand for a product you're loving, we inspired you as you were listening to us, or maybe you shop a store you love, tell me about it. Email a voice memo to info at fatmascara.com. It's time for you to raise one. Clearly, you are an expert. You don't even need Fat Mascara listeners' help to find a product, but you brought us some products to raise one to, I hope. I did. Because you alluded to this perfume. Yeah. Now I've been sitting here with bated breath waiting to know what it is. What perfume are you raising a wand to? All right. So it's what I'm wearing to record right now. It is Maison Deto Rotano. I know that both of you are familiar with the brand and fans, but... I have such a soft spot in my heart for this brand because I was an unashamed horse girl as a kid. <gasps> I had... You guys, we have one in the studio. Yeah. We love horse girls. <laughs> we just didn't know them growing up. Tell us everything. Yeah. So I had... I was subscribed to like a kid's horse magazine. So I had horse posters all over my walls. I did the like horseback riding overnight summer camp. Yeah. It was definitely a thing for me. I don't... Unfortunately, I don't have the opportunity to ride regularly now. It's kind of hard in New York City. Yeah. But that's why I love this fragrance is that it immediately kind of transports me to a stable. It has that hay smell. It has that wonderful kind of horse poop vibe in a good way. Alex started my podcast on butts and she's ending my podcast on butts. Yeah. Thank you, I'm, Alex. I'm so sorry. <laughs> No, I know I know what you're talking about, that grassy kind of like... Yeah, grassy, greenish. Jasmine manure in a good way. Yeah, exactly. So it's a very kind of like nostalgic smell for me. And I, I just love it. It's really comforting. And, the, and tell me the name of which one? Rotano. Rotano. Okay. Yes. I have the candle as well. The candle's also great. It fills a room very quickly. I hate when you light a candle and you can't smell it unless you're up close to it. But this one's very room filling. So disappointing. Even if the cold throw is fine and then you heat it up and it's like, why did I bother? But they have yeah. a good candle. That's good. To, I didn't even actually know that they made candles. Is there any other candles you like? Can confirm. The brand is called Un Soir à l'Opera, so A Night at the Opera. And okay. the candle name is Romeo and Juliet. It is <gasps> a jasmine candle. It's the best jasmine candle I've ever smelled. That's a romantic concept as well. Yeah. It's funny you brought that up. I just had a night at the opera, which is not a regular thing for me, but I got to go. My friend got a discounted ticket. I went to Lincoln Center. This has not happened in hundreds of years. Okay, fine. Dozens of years. But it happened the night I was there. The scenery froze. <laughs> you know how you go to like the Met Opera in New York City for like these huge productions? And it was Turandot, and it, which is normally like a huge stage production. There might be some animals involved, like hundreds of dancers. And instead, they like did it, I don't know, cabaret style. There was one set because it was frozen on that set. And all of the 80 singers were squished into the first five feet of the set. It was so weird. Like the girl had to kill herself, but there was no soldier there <laughs> that was a dancer to take the, the knife from. This is opera. You know how these are. So she just like mimed the... I had no idea what was going on. Anyway, I'm going to go back to the opera. And if I don't, I'm going to light this candle. I really digressed there. But <laughs> who's ever heard of that happening? It's the Met. It's supposed to be like the top of the line, best of the world opera house. That would give me like secondhand stress to see that happening in real time. A bunch of people walked out because they offered. Peter Gelb comes up and he is like, okay, it's not working if you'd like to leave. And I was like, I can't leave. I don't want to be that jerk who actually came yeah. for the dancers and not the opera singers. <laughs> they put so much into it. So I stayed. But a night at the opera as a candle. I love that. What, is there anything else you want to raise a want to? Yes, there's one other product. I think it came out last month. It's the Danessa Myricks. Yummy Skin Moisture Repair Balm Serum. I know that's a mouthful, but it's basically a hydrating primer. It looks like when you open it, so don't, don't judge a book by its cover in this case. When you open it, it looks like it would make your skin really oily because it comes in this like pot that looks kind of like a very rich like aquaphor balm. But when you okay. actually put it on, the texture and consistency is super, super light and watery. So when you put it on, it's very mattifying, but it's it's like a soft matte. We're not talking like extreme matte. So I actually put this over my sunscreen as a primer and 
It's amazing. Lasts all day. So you do sunscreen, this, and then do you do foundation on top? Mm -hmm. And you're not getting pilling? No pilling at all. What's the sunscreen you use? I feel like lately everything I layer is turning into rubber cement balls when I put it on. I use the Super Goop Everyday Play sunscreen. Okay. And then this is your in-between. Yeah. So here's my question. Her, By the way, her textures are so good. Every product she comes out with, you think you're like, oh, I know all the textures, balm, serum, whatever, blush. But they always have like a break to them when you rub them on your skin and or blend them in. That's just like, how did she do that? Yeah, it's magical. It's kind of magical. Even her color, skin correcting color kind of products, you're just like, is this skincare or is this color care? Everything is good. The lip products are good. But why would I want something like this? Do you find that the sunscreen isn't a nice base for your color or it just gives you that matte thing that you want? So I have combination skin and the Supergoop Unseen Sunscreen is really the only sunscreen that works for me, like under my makeup, where it's moisturizing but not too oily where like my T-zone becomes a mess. This I think just helps a lot with just like keeping the excess oil on my T-zone at bay. And also sometimes when I wear foundation, like by the end of the day, it gets like a little bit dry, if you know what I'm talking about, where you can kind of like, you start to see the texture in like certain areas of your face. If you use this Danessa Myricks Balm, your foundation looks like you just put it on for the entire day. Okay, sold. That's reason enough. (laughs) It's funny you say that thing about the texture. There's like certain lines from certain guests at Fat Mascara that have stuck with me over the years. And when Emily Weiss of Glossier fame was on, she was talking about how at the end of the day, she would look in the mirror and she would feel like a Picasso in that puzzle pieces to her face, which I totally knew what she was talking about. Like the areas where you move a lot, like the foundation sort of cracks open. Yeah. That's what you're talking about, right? It cracks open. And then sometimes for me, like I get, it looks like a little bit dry and like textured, but this, I wore it. I was at work. I was out for like eight, nine hours all day yesterday. And I wore this balm yesterday. When I came home, I immediately went to the mirror. I like looked at my skin up close and I was like, looks great. May I ask, so we can like get the full Razor Wand experience from product to product, what foundation you put on top of the Danessa Merrick's balm? I use the Mega Forever HD Skin Liquid Foundation. The new version of it that just came out, the Hydra Freshy no, one or not the original? The, the original one. It's a classic. It's a great foundation. I used to use that before I switched to this cosmetics one I've been using. Okay, so that three-layer combo on somebody with combination skin, you get like eight hours out of your face. Yes. I need to go buy all of these things immediately because your skin looks amazing. And I feel like people with combination skin, it's even tougher because the products that do what it needs to do for maybe dry cheeks don't do what needs to be done for the T-zone. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Oh, I love this. I don't even want to raise my wand now. No, please do. I want to hear yours. (laughs) (laughs) Yours are too good. I will because it's fragrance and I know you love fragrance. Yeah. So there's this British company that I've become obsessed with called Fern with two Fs because I really like their whole concept. First of all, they were the first perfume company not to do plastic packaging. So the whole thing comes in glass or paper. But what they do is once you're in their club, they send out each season a full-size fragrance sealed, but then also a sample kit with the fragrance so that you can test it, sample it. And only if you like it, do you break the seal on their perfume and keep it. And you might think like other brands do that. Well, the other thing they do is it's all natural. I keep looking for like non-synthetic ingredient perfumes, not because I'm worried about synthetic ingredients. In fact, I think they make perfumes a million times better, but I want to see who's playing in the natural world and like actually pushing perfumery forward, not just mixing stuff in their bathroom sink. And so the fragrance that came out for spring 2024 is rhubarb. Do you like a rhubarb scent? You know, I'm not super familiar with rhubarb fragrances, so I can't say. It's funny because it's also like a, is that a fruit or a vegetable? It's a vegetable, I think. It's also something that like, it doesn't smell like, it smells very green and not like much when you smell it when it's fresh, but when you bake it in like a rhubarb pie or the way that most people experience rhubarb, it has this tart plum, very almost citrus-like, but still with the vegetal celery thing happening. So it's a fruity, but I would say, 
Is it a fruity vegetable fragrance? (gasps) Did I just coin that? You know how there's fruity florals, which we're all familiar with? Yes. Obviously. We need fruity vegetables or fruity herbals, you know? So it takes the fruit to a more sophisticated place. And I think rhubarb is the perfect example of that. And they did a really good job with it in this scent. It's so delightful. It smells like early spring, like March spring when it's 30 degrees out. And you're like, is it spring? But I smell something in the air that tells me it's spring, even though I'm freezing. Like it's a little bracing. You know what I mean? Can you order samples from them? Or do you have to be part of the club to receive a little travel size? Excellent question. And everybody's going to hate me because they're going to go to the website. And I just noticed when you're on there right now, there's a waiting list for the being part of being sent the things. I think that probably because so many people want to be part of the club. If they're smart, do you hear this, Fern? They're going to start selling sampler packs. But I also know part of the business model is that it's all naturals. And as we know, that would be really hard to stay consistent from year to year based on what the crop was like that year. I always think about this with naturals because this is the thing. When Glossier U changed, and we all know it did, when they went international, people notice the difference. Even if they do everything they need to to make sure the ingredients are the same with synthetic molecules and just adjusting preservatives that need to be adjusted for going to a new market, you could still smell a difference. Think about naturals. Oh, well, this spring, the roses, it was really wet, so the roses weren't as strong or whatever it is. That doesn't make sense. So my guess is, yeah, my guess is that they can't yet do that. Hmm. So I'm going to raise a wand to it anyway, because I like that it's opening up these questions for other business models and other people to sort of make fragrance and perfumery more sustainable, which is a personal interest of mine. But rhubarb, girl, you got to get into it. There's (laughs) one I'll send you from Hermes does one. And then, oh, wait, hold on. I'm going to go get it. Okay, at the risk of maybe being incorrect, I pulled out very quickly two rhubarb. Oh, it is rhubarb. I knew it. Okay, so this is Hermes Eau de Rhubarb et Carlatte. Your French is better than mine. Oh, my God, it's so good. It's juicy but still creamy and vanilla. And then I think that this fragrance, it's called Flashback from Olfactive Studio. Do you know this perfume no, house? No, okay, I'm going to write these down. Okay, I think this is a rhubarb scent. It's like a bracing fruit. It's like a greenish. I have to use color terms and I'm probably annoying everybody and they've zoned out and they know it's the end of Raisin Wand and they're like, Jen's getting crazy. Time to get off the (laughs) the mic. But both of those to me are delicious rhubarb scents. And the one from Fern is a more natural version of those. So take notes if anybody listening wants to get in on the fruity vegetal trend that we just coined here. Me and (laughs) Alex on Fat Mascara, episode 526. All right, I think... I mean, I want to keep talking to you, especially about fragrance, but it's time for everybody to get their beauty sleep. You've been a wonderful guest co-host. Thank you so much for coming on the show. Thank you so much for having me. This has been so much fun. We hope you enjoyed the show. It's your reviews and feedback that help us make the podcast even better. Head over to iTunes to rate and review us or email your thoughts to info at fatmascara.com. We also want to answer your beauty questions and hear what products you love. To share a Razor One product with you or to ask a beauty question, email us at info at Fat Mascara. If you send it as a voice memo file, we can even share your voice on the podcast. You can also do that by leaving us a voice message. Our phone number in the United States is 646-481-8182. Thanks so much for listening. Mm-hmm.